Hello everyone! Yes, it's finally happened! I told you I was going to get it done this summer and I am keeping my promise. This is the top 100 for the Broken Meeple, my 100 favourite games that I have ever played. I love doing these lists, they take a fair bit of effort to collate 100 different games, but I enjoy it every year and I make certain I do it every year as part of my anniversary of starting this blog. I'm now past the four year mark for doing The Broken Meeple. I started four years ago as just a simple little written review blog and then it's grown to the podcast, to YouTube, to the Dice Tower Network, to you know, review copies and just being a little bit more well known. I mean, I'm not talking like world famous here. That was never the intention and that's never going to happen anyway. You know, I'm just small fry, like everyone else. I'm another bloke who enjoys games and just likes to give his opinion on such matters. But yeah, four years, I've enjoyed it. It's had its highs, it's had its lows. But at the end of the day, it's the highs always outweigh those lows because you just get such a kick out of this hobby. You know, it's a great community. It's a great hobby. You get the odd blemish, but as long as you don't let those put you down too much, you're on your way. So, tap 100. This year, I've done things slightly differently with how I collated the list. Basically, when I started doing it, I was doing a top 75, and that was pretty much as much as I felt like doing. I wanted to be different, so I thought, everyone does 100, I'll do 75. Well, then I sort of realised that 75 was a weird number, and I was cutting out a lot of games I wanted to talk about. So, last year, I stepped it up to 100. I did my top 100. I don't think I did a geek list for it, but I will for this one, I promise. And... It was good, I enjoyed it, but the problem was comparing a top 75 to a top 100 was a little bit skewiffy. This year though, we can at least compare a top 100 to another top 100. So I will be making references to last year's list as I go through this one. And if you want spoiler warning, there's the list. There you go, spoiled. I'm sure one of you will be able to somehow freeze the frame and capture the entire list in perfect game. I don't know. Uh, well, it depends how good your skills are. But yeah, I've enjoyed doing this one, and last year I used Tom Vassell's methodology, which was literally just write down a ton of games on some labels and look at two in succession and go, which one do I prefer, this one or this one? Put it over there, and then do it all with labels. Whew, that was fiddly and it took a while. This time, though, I want to give credit to Pub Meeple. You can find them on Twitter, you can find them, I think, on Facebook as well, and they have a website. What they do is that they do these occasional little, like, you know, written articles, but they do little resource tools that, you know, you can use for various means. And the tool that I used on this occasion, which I know Eric Summer has used for his list as well, is their board game ranking tool. Now, it's pretty much a beta mode at this point. You know, it's not fully finished and there is some room for improvement. But essentially, it does similar to what I described with those labels, except that you import the list from Excel or some you know similar Excel file and it has the list on there. The easiest way, like I did, was to simply export your collection from BoardGameGeek and then just filter it by whatever you needed. And so it automatically brings up two on the screen and you click on whether you prefer one or the other or you think they're about the same. You go through hundreds of these comparisons and it automatically ranks them at the end in a nice, easy to print list. Although you do end up with quite a few tiebreakers, and I'll get onto that in a minute. But essentially, I took, at first, I took every single game that I've ranked seven or higher on Board Game Geek. That resulted in a few hundred games. Yeah, a few too many to pick from. So then I started cutting the list down. I started cutting the list to games that I actually owned you know, owned properly, with the exception of some games where it's like, yeah, I haven't got the room for them or they're big event ones. So most of the ones that I didn't own, I didn't, you know, necessarily consider. And so that cut out a fair few. I then cut out a, a lot of games that were seven ranked, you know, because I figured, well, when I cut out the sevens, I still had quite a fair few games that were eight, nine, and ten. So, you know, I had to think about that as well. So by the time I'd done several of these cuts, I ended up with about 150, just over 150 games to do my final top 100 cut from. And in doing so, I basically did a top 152 technically. But I'm only going to concentrate on the top 100 for these videos. I'm going to do 10 batches of 10, including this one. And, you know, this one will be longer than the others because I've got to give this intro. But, you know, the rest I'll try and keep as short as I can because I don't want them to drag on too long. And then there'll probably be another video at the end where I'll go over my 
hit in my misses, you know, the ones that dropped off the list from last year, and I'll give some more commentary on my choices as I go through. But I just wanted to let you know that was how things were done, you know, I used a tool, I collated over 156 games to come up with my top 100, and this was cut down from something like four to 500 potentials, you know, there was a lot of games to be considered for a top 100 list, and it was difficult just to get from 152 to 100, because there are a few games on this list from, you know, that are like in the 101 to 152 category, that's like, oh, I do like that game, but it, there's only so much that can fit on a top 100 list, and these are all games I enjoy. Uh, I mean, okay, I enjoy doing a negative review as much as the next person when they come along, you know, to give a bit of a rant and give my opinion at the end of the day, but, there's something to be said about the passion that you get from just talking about games that you love. And these are games that I love. All 100 of these games I love. Yes, not all of them are perfect games. No game ever is. Even my number one is not perfect. But they're just ones that give me the, so much enjoyment when I am playing these games. So that's all I can really say about it. Like I said, 10 videos of 10 and some commentary in that. I will put this geek list up on uh, Board Game Geek. As I go through, so as I do each video and upload it, I will update the geek list, because believe me, putting 100 games on the geek list takes a long time. And that's essentially the deal. I will try and get these videos out as regularly as I can throughout the month of August. Maybe we'll overlap into September slightly, but you know, like I say, I've got to keep up with the reviews and also the podcast while I'm doing this. So, you know, it takes a lot of effort. You know, believe me, it takes a bit of effort. But yeah, I'm just going to go over each title, give a quick reason of why I like it, move on to the next one. I'm not going to explain all the key mechanics and all the key rules. I'm going to try and limit it to maybe a couple of minutes on each one and try and keep the video down to a reasonably good length level. With the exception of this one because obviously of this long intro. And I bet you're all getting bored by now, so let's get into it. Hey, 100 games. Let's get started with number 100. My number 100 is a new debut to the list. In fact, actually, just to give a quick little fact about this, uh, since last time, um, I was comparing 175, and I think there was uh, eight games that fell off the list and about 33 or so that joined the list. Well, 75 to 100, what do you expect? This year, 27 games have fallen off the list from last year, and 28 games have debuted on this list. So we've got an even ins and outs. Of course, where do most of those feature? Well, first one is a debut, and that is TAC. This is a fairly recently released abstract game for two players, which apparently was based on some, you know, game that takes place in a series. Was it Vikings or something else? I can't remember, but I don't, I've not watched the series, so I didn't care about the origin as such. But I like abstract games, you know, I talk about theme, but I do like a good, simple two-player abstract. And this one has a little bit more complexity with the rules because you've got the uh, tiles that lay flat, stand up, the one that jumps on top, but it's a really cool stacking abstract game where you're maneuvering the pieces to try and make a bridge from one end to the other and you know you're laying them flat, you're blocking with the ones that stand up, you're using this one pawn to collapse others and it's all about trying to spot the combo paths really screws with your head. I am not an expert at abstract games by any means, I don't play them often enough to become expert but every time I play this one, I am locked in mental combat with the opponent. I've won some games, I've lost other games. It's a really good hit for me, and I a bit overpriced, I will admit, but you do get lots of chunky wood pieces. So Tack just made my number 100. My number 99 is a fairly small card game that can take up to seven players and it's essentially a one versus many type game. It's really cool, it involves a lot of that secret like, oh, get in their head, where do I think they're gonna go? And that is Not Alone from Geek Attitude Games. This one is a solid card game where basically players are facing off against this one alien player and it's all about secret movement. 
you have this uh, planet of locations where you have to move across and you have to survive a certain length of time to win the game. Of course, the alien is trying to hunt you down and you are playing your location cards to try and escape the alien and the alien is trying to figure out where you're likely to go. As your options get more limited, the alien starts being able to figure out where you are and starts, you know, hunting specific people down. It's a really cool mental battle with the alien and the normal players. And I like how it's a one versus many. You don't get many of those games that aren't dungeon crawls these days. And this is a pretty simple game. Doesn't take many rules to teach, you know, there's a bit more depth to how you play. But that just comes with repeated plays. Teaching the rules of this is pretty simple. Um, there's an expansion coming out that I tested at the UK Games Expo that looks pretty cool. And I think there's another expansion after that that's going to add some more complexity. So this one ain't going away anytime soon. But not alone for me. Plays in about 45 minutes, you know, an hour tops if you're a bit slow. But two to seven players, personally, better with more players. But still, I get a kick out of not alone. It hits the table every now and again. But I enjoy it. My number 99. So we've had two new debuts already. Well, this one is not a new debut. In fact, I have a suspicion that this is uh, the greatest drop out of all the games on this list. This, well, not including ones that have fallen off the list entirely. The ones that have stayed on though, this has dropped 64 places since last year. A huge drop. Not because I don't like the game, but it doesn't hit the table as often because it's quite long and quite heavy. And that is, heavy in more than one way, nations. This is my go-to pick to coincide with Through the Ages. Through the Ages is a good game. I like it, I think the new reprint is great, and if you like long games that are about civilization building, I recommend you check it out. Nations, though, is my personal pick, because it's easier to teach. This one has more streamlined rules, I think, than Through the Ages does, because Through the Ages has got a lot of complexities to it. This one, I feel, just does it in a simpler manner, but it's still that same type of game. You have your civilization, you collect the cards off a tableau, you know, to upgrade your buildings, but you have that element of worker placement where you have to put your workers on the buildings themselves and, you know, they generate resources. But it's dropped because it's hard to get to the table, because it is quite long, you're talking at least two and a half hours, maybe a three hour game, and there's only so many people that I know that are willing to try out a card-based civilization game. But it's definitely worth checking out, and if you've got the expansion to this, like I have Dynasties, that's a must-buy for this because you have a unique faction for your, you know, starting resources and that, and special abilities. Dynasties adds, like, another, what, like, 10, 12 different, you know, factions, you know, America and Mongolia and all these different ones, and they're all really unique abilities. Such a good expansion, easy to pick up, and I certainly recommend you get it if you have this game. But if you want to try Through the Ages with a little bit more accessibility, but still with that heavyweight, you know, civilization building feel, then I do recommend Nations. Just make sure you got some spare time to be able to fit it into your evening. Next up, we have a new mechanic that took, well, I don't think it took the board gaming world by that much storm, but I think we're going to get a new one in the system at Gen Con this year. And this one, you know, still has a soft spot with me and some friends of mine, and that is Mystic Veil for my 97 now, I believe. Mystic Veil is a new game in what they call the card crafting system, where basically it's similar to deck building, except rather than add more cards to a deck, you add more abilities to the cards you already have. So you have these blank maybe sleeve, you know, cards in sleeves and you collect these like translucent little plastic bits with the ability printed on them and you slot them in and then you can have up to three abilities for a single card so you can have lots of like cards with small abilities or you can have one big card with an awesome combo ability that only comes out every so often. It's a really neat concept. It is a little multiplayer solitaire-ish though which is a slight flaw hence it's not as high on the list as it could be and you know you have to Put up with a little bit of AP even some players at times, but once you get used to it, it's a really cool game and the expansions, as expensive as they are, do add more variety in the cards. So it requires a little bit of investment, but it's still a very solid, new, unique and innovative entry into board gaming in general. If you're a fan of deck building, 
You might get a kick out of this one, even though it's not technically deck building, it's card building, but it's that similar line. I mean, we like bag building, we like pool building, we like deck building, this is card building. So if you like any of those sort of, uh, you know, build an engine and get it working games, then this one is definitely one to check out. The artwork is beautiful and the components are really solid. They're good cards, they're good, you know, it's a generally an all round good card game. But like I say, still only managed to make number 97 on this list. My number 95 dropped 30 places from last year because mainly just it doesn't hit the table as much as I would like, despite it being a really good two player game. And that's probably a little theme. There are exceptions, but you know, the less I can get it to the table, the more it has a bit of an impact on its rating, unless it's like stellar and I love it. But this one is a solid two player game from, uh, I believe the name was, yeah, Andreas Steiger. Hope I didn't uh, butcher that name. But this one is Targi. Targi is an underrated two-player game where it's worker placement. So worker placement for two players, hmm, you don't see that very often. But in this one, you have you know cards that you're collecting for points, but you have this cool blocking mechanism where you have a grid on the outside that you place your pawn on to use its ability, but it blocks the entire row or column from your opponent. And that just, you know, it opens up ways to annoy your opponent while also getting what you need. It's just a cool back and forth Simple rules, simple you know, concepts, nothing too great, and the components are relatively cool, you know, I mean, you get some basic little meeple pieces, but the cards themselves, graphic design is good, you know, it's pretty easy to follow, pretty easy to play, but it creates a lot of good tension for a two-player game that only takes about, what, an hour to play max? Yeah, about an hour. And you don't often get many worker placement games that work well with two players, and this is one that I highly recommend. I wish it did more players, but like I say, two player games, when I can get them to the table, are good fun, and this is definitely one I recommend. So my number 96, it, yeah, 96, not 95, sorry, is Targi. Okay, getting my numbers right this time. This is my actual 95, and it's another new debut. This one was a game that I'd only heard about from Z Garcia on the Dice Tower. He'd mentioned it in one video, a top 10 for free players, I believe the list was. And I found it on clearance at the expo recently, and decided, you know what, on clearance price, I need to try this one, because it's intriguing. And that one is Trieste. Trieste is unique in that it only plays free players. You can't play this with any other player account. It has to be free players, no more, no less. And the reason for that is because each player has their own deck because they play one of three factions, City Watch, Merchant, and Thieves, and each one keys off another person's deck. They each have their own winning condition and objective that they're aiming for, but they fulfill their objective by basically wailing on one of the other players, but then they also have to keep on tabs with the player who's wailing on them because they're fulfilling their own objective. So it works in this great little triangle of, you know, having to tailor how much you're going to, you know, wail on this person while defending yourself from another. And there's even a little bit of negotiation that goes on because, you know, somebody might be actively trying to stop you, but if they stop you too much, they might be helping the other person win. And people can pull out some good surprise victories here. It takes a little bit of time to get used to your deck, but there's only about, you know, 33 cards in each deck and there's duplicates, so you've only got to read so many cards and the rules are fairly simple. The, the, the turn phase is dirt simple and the cards themselves aren't that complex either, so you shouldn't have too much ambiguity as you go through. But it's a really neat game that I think should have got more buzz. It is typical victory point games in terms of its component quality. I mean, let's face it, you know, you literally have this box and, you know, comes in a little sleeve and it's basically like a you know almost like a stationary box or a shoe box type thing you know it's a not great on the component front but at the end of the day i just want a bunch of cards that have okayish artwork on them you know it's the artwork's all right actually it certainly beats most stuff that dominion used to come out with in its early days and like i say it's an underrated free player only game that's worth checking out if you can just get that player account on a regular basis that is trieste my actual 95. My 
number 94 I had played last year, I think, but I don't think it quite made my top 100. But since then, I've been warming up to it a bit more and more as I've gotten more plays of it, and I'm actually excited to see what the new expansion brings out when it gets released this year. I've already playtested one of the four modules in the expansion at the Expo, and I look forward to see what the rest do. But, so far, Splendor has been warming up to me. It is in my collection because I do enjoy the game itself. You know, it's a very streamlined, very simple Euro game. Yes, it's not entirely multiplayer solitaire because you do have to keep an eye on what the other players are doing in case they nick your cards. But the turns are super quick. Yeah, well, <laughs> minus AP players, obviously. But turns are quick, components are decent, you know, the art is colorful, even if the theme is super pasted on like ridiculous. And it just flows really nicely and there's a good amount of tactics to it. The Cities expansion, I think, is going to elevate this one further up the list because I think it's going to add some really cool modules to it. But this one is a perfect gateway game as well. You know, my collection has several gateway games that I think are perfect for bringing new people in. And this is a great one for teaching them a typical engine building Euro mechanic. You know, it is you can teach it in less than five minutes. You know, if that, you can get going, they'll play it and they'll think, that was pretty neat. You know, can we play that again? Or something? I know what to aim for this time. And... Perfect, you've got them sold. It gets a little bit of flack from some people because it is basically a dry, pasted Euro, you know, at the end of the day. But I think it deserves a lot of the praise it gets because it is, you know, it's still a good game. Not the best ever. I mean, like I say, it's, what, I mean, 94? You know, it's not the highest game on my list. But I like it. It's streamlined. It's easy. Looks good. And I think the expansions are going to improve it more. Um, spoiler alert, Century Spice Road did not make my top 100, you know, I, I like it, it's okay, but I personally prefer Splendor. Check out my review on Century Spice Road to hear more detail on that. But for now, 94, Splendor! My number 93, I'm afraid I can't show you the box for because I've repackaged it into one of my other games. And that is Legendary Encounters, a Firefly deck building game. Now, I have separated these Legendary Encounter games out because I feel they play differently enough. Will you see all the others on this list? Well, you'll have to wait and see. Maybe one didn't quite make it. Maybe one did. Maybe they both did. Who knows? But the Firefly one. I love Firefly. I think Firefly is a great series. It's worth checking out. I mean, it's 14 episodes. Come on, if you can binge watch Walking Dead and you know, Game of Thrones, you can watch Firefly. It's 14 episodes and it's just the perfect blend of sci-fi, western, wit, humour. It's brilliant. Love it. Love the movie. It's fantastic. Why did it get cancelled? Stupid fox. Anyway, I digress. But the Firefly Legendary Encounter system takes that universe and puts it very nicely in its deck building world. You know, you have the map along the top where the hidden cards come out, but all your scenarios, and you play three at a time, or you can play it in one long campaign mode, are all the episodes in the series. So the theme is very strong. All the stuff that you encounter, the enemies, the objectives and that, are all tied in specifically to those episodes. And if you're a fan of the series like I am, you will essentially get a nice nostalgic kick out of those scenarios as you go, Ah, oh, yeah, there was that lady, and yes, oh, we gotta go rob this train now, like they did in the show, and it's really cool. And I do like how the way that the decks are tailored depend on which characters you're using and which ones you're not using. So you play an avatar, which has your special ability and a special card for you, but then your decks that you buy the cards from are all the characters you didn't take as avatars. That's quite a neat decision to make at the start of the game, and I really like how that worked out. The main flaw with this and you know I mean it's it's I enjoy it I wish there was more content that's the only thing that they've kind of maxed out what they can do with it and there's not really much more they can provide but the biggest killer for this game is the artwork there is some gorgeous artwork in this I love the avatar cards some of the artworks in fact I think Zoe her character on her card it's like almost photorealistic to what it is in the show it's that uncanny but a lot of the artwork in this game is so bad, it's outright embarrassing to show it on the table. There's just some horrific artwork in this game and it does hurt it dramatically. But mechanically, I still think it's solid. But because you don't get that many cards, I've basically repackaged it into another game because they have this giant box 
that's oversized for it is just pointless. So I've basically taken the cards, put them in another similar game, and essentially, you know, I can pull from it as I wish. So Firefly, a legendary encounters game, or whatever order you want to put the words in, it's still a solid game, but like I say, you're just going to have to get past that horrible artwork. My 92, I seem to think that in my local gaming groups, I'm the only one who champions this game because I still really enjoy it. It's simple, it's fast. If you don't play it with four players, just keep it with two or three. But it's just a complete mishmash of everything that is great in geekdom and nerdism, if you want to call it that. And that is a game that I really don't want to pull off the shelf because it's super heavy. Come on, drag it out. Come on. Hiya. Oh, Jesus, let me love it then. Woo. Smash up. I really enjoy just basically taking two factions out of pretty much every area of geekdom and shoving them together and going out and battling. There are so many combinations to this game, it is ridiculous. And the reason this is so heavy is because this is the big geeky box which I have filled out like crazy with all the expansions that have come out. I mean, I kid you not. I'll show you this. I've got like a bunch of rule books here, you know, all the and the sheets to help with the bases and that. But I'll just take that. Here you go. All of that. That is every expansion of Smash Up to date. And there's still room at the bottom of the box to fit more cards. It's ridiculous. And these are all sleeved. This is sleeved cards and there's still room in this box. It is ridiculous how much is in this thing. But I get a big kick out of this one. I think it's a solid game. It, granted, I don't like playing it with four players because I think it takes too long. But two to three players, I think, is a good sweet spot. Don't play with AP players because some people will overthink this like crazy. Just get two factions, shove them together, and go out there and beat up stuff. You know, don't treat this like a heavy Euro. It's meant to be light. It's meant to be quite fluffy. But, I don't know, I just get a kick out of combining all these factions. You know, I want ninja dinosaurs, I want bear cavalry steampunk, I want the, the cultists of Cthulhu combined with uh, fluffy kittens. You know, it, there's so many different weird combinations you get with this, and they're still coming out with more and more, and if they stopped, I'd be perfectly content. I think I might get to a point where I'll fill up the whole geeky box, and then I'll be, you know, satisfied. But, yeah. There's more than enough stuff there to keep me happy for ages. I just wish more people in my local gaming groups appreciated that this is a cool game. So my number, my number 92, yes, my number 92 is Smash Up. Check it out, guys. This needs more love, I think. And finally, for this episode, my number 91. This one is basically a classic among co-op games everywhere, although not the version you're thinking of. Basically, there is a series called Pandemic. You may have heard of it. Certainly, if you watch anything on the Dice Star, you've heard of it from Z, his favourite game ever. Well, I like Pandemic. But it's not been my favourite co-op. I find it more of a puzzle game more than a thematic game. But, you know, it's a brilliant gateway game and I felt that, you know what, I need one in my collection, but I need to choose the version that I love. Which one is it that gives me the biggest buzz when I play it? And that is the recent special edition called Pandemic Iberia. Spoiler alert, this is the only Pandemic game on this list. But the reason I like Iberia a lot is because, one, it looks very stellar on the table. I mean, the map is gorgeous. You know, you've got the areas of Iberia and Spain, you know, with all the unique names. But I like the roles. The roles in this, the characters you can play are very unique and they're very interesting. I like the trains that you can build on the play on the map. It speeds up your movement. And I think that just, um, I felt that movement was so restricted in the original pandemic, you know, with the whole, I must get rid of a car to fly here or we're miles away from this end of the world. I mean, yeah, it's realistic. But, you know, I liked building the train tracks to make your movement quicker. But one thing that makes this one even more better is the two variants. There are two variants in this game. You can make the diseases unique to what they were in real life. So you can actually, instead of just being yellow, blue and black, it's actually typhoid and, you know, scarlet fever or whatever. I forget their names. But, or malaria and things like that. And each one has a unique property. So it might spread twice as fast. It might be harder to get rid of, that kind of thing. 
they add a nice level of difficulty to this game. And the base version is actually, I would say, slightly easier than base Pandemic. So it's more inviting for new players, but just change those diseases up and the difficulty increases. But the best one in there is the hospital variant. When you build the hospitals normally, it's like, yeah, yeah I can go cure the disease, great, no bad thing. Here though, as soon as you build a hospital, there's a rule that then makes the cubes, which are effectively patients, they start slowly congregating towards those hospitals and as such they might cause outbreaks en route or more often than not they will reach the hospital and cause their own outbreak because the hospital just can't treat that many patients. I find that really cool and really thematic because if you've got a massive epidemic going around and everybody's going to panic and go to the hospital that's what they would do. It's what they do in the movies it's what you would do in real life. Would you just sit at home all day? No you would go to the first person you think you could treat your disease and this one rep that variant replicates that in this game and it not only ups the difficulty, but it just adds that element of theme that I felt was lost on the original Pandemic. I know In The Lab added a fair bit of theme, but that was pretty complex and you just could not teach that as a gateway game. So this is the Pandemic I'm hanging on to. Looks stellar, great variants, great difficulty tweaking. This is my personal opinion, and my personal opinion, sorry, the best Pandemic game that has come out, you know, yeah, well, I'm excluding Pandemic Legacy from the list because, spoiler alert, again, not on my list. I've played it. It's actually mounted on my wall over there, the box. Well, sorry, the board. But, yeah, you play it through once and I'm kind of done with it now. So I really enjoyed it, but I can't really put it on a top 100 list because, well, I'm done with it now. I want Season 2, but I'm never going to play Season 1 again. So it didn't really fit the list. So, anyway, honour for 91 goes to Pandemic Iberia. And that's it for this top 10, 100 part portion, whatever. Basically, that's why I'm going to do this. Lots of videos with 10 games apiece. So this was my 100 to 91. I hope there were some games that you liked the look of. Maybe you want to try it yourself. Do you agree with what I've put on? Do you think they were too high, too low? Do you think they don't deserve to be on the list at all? You know, I want your comments in the feed below. I want you to message me on Facebook and Twitter and talk about it because I love hearing about how people would rank similar games on their own thing. You know, it's all about community engagement. That's what I'm about. So that's it for me. I probably, I'm going to get on with doing the next batch of 10 actually. Get the first 20 out of the way nice and quick. So that's it for me. And for these 10 games, just remember at the end of the day, they are still only games, no matter how high or low they appear on this list. Take care, everyone, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the top 100.